people. Hey, what is happening, people? This is another episode of A Day Talk for Educators Live. This is your host, Kwame Salfamensa, coming to you live from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And we have a very special guest today. I have here my brother, Mr. Chase Patterson, coming out of Pittsburgh. He is the CEO of the Urban Academy, which is the oldest charter school in the city of Pittsburgh. But he's doing so many other things in the community. You know, you have here an educator, philanthropist, activist, entrepreneur. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, so many wonderful things to say about this brother. So I'm just excited to have the opportunity to have this conversation with them. And we just want to welcome Mr. Chase Patterson to the show. So welcome, sir. Thank you, brother Kwame, man. That was one of the best introductions I've, I've ever had. Uh, well, so I'm welcome. looking forward to, to writing it down and then handing it to the next person. <laughs> nah, no <laughs> doubts. Uh, well deserved. But, uh, Thank you, brother. Man, but let's get right into it. So just yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you into the education space. Um, so I, I'm born and raised here in Pittsburgh. Went to Pittsburgh schools, University of Pittsburgh. Never lived anywhere but uh, Pittsburgh. And I've become in, enriched and enamored by both the legacy and the possibilities of what Pittsburgh can be for Black people. And I believe that my work, both in education and in business and uh, in uh, all of the, the the realms that I'm in, and, and in particular being a father, um, I'm always reminded of that legacy, and I'm always um, reminded of the, the great potential that we have. And I thoroughly believe that that's rooted most specifically in early education, um, whether it's pre-K or daycare, um, and, and the primary grades K through, through five, I believe that that is where the foundation is laid outside of the home, of course. Um, and so that's, that's really, you know, how I got, I got to the passion of, of my work. Um, but the, the lineal steps is I was on the board of the school and, uh, it was transitioning in leadership. Um, and I thought that, that I could, along with my colleagues on the board, make it a bigger impact and a bigger difference. And I think um, since I took over three years ago, uh, we've, we've made some great strides in respect to the history of who we are as a school and, a, and an organization. Awesome. But I just wanna let you know, your influence is pretty widespread. So a few episodes ago, well, many episodes ago, um, I had the brother, Mr. Cecil Price, uh, on the show, and he just shouted you out and said, you know, Mr. Patterson was definitely mm -hmm. one of my mentors just growing up and going through the education system. So just want to let you know your influence is very much widespread uh, throughout the Pittsburgh area. So, Thank you. Yeah. And Cecil's a great, um, Cecil's going to be a very, very important person in, yes, in our he future. Yes, he is. I believe that. <laughs> And um, I, I'm just here to, very similar to the work that you do, here to help, encourage, and, and um, uplift him as best and as much I can. Absolutely. But let's uh, keep talking about the Urban Academy. So you are currently the CEO of the school. So can you just share with yeah. us the mission of the school and what role specifically do you play in the school's operation so that everybody knows what exactly you do? Yeah, great, great question. So the mission of the school is to provide a superior education to all students, particularly those who are economically disadvantaged um, through science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, but most importantly, um, centered around culture, particularly Black and African culture. Um, and so that, that's who we've been for 20 years. And we also see ourselves as an organization that's responsible for being a constructive contributor to their community. So it's not just about our school, it's about how we are contributing 
uh, to our community and to our, our families. Uh, my role as CEO is to help operate or operationalize the vision and uh, the mission and the objectives of the school. Uh, I've got a principal and chief academic officer as well as a chief operating officer who I work very closely with. And we are responsible for directing the day-to-day -day operations of the organization and ensuring that uh, we are meeting the goals as outlined by, by our board of trustees, primarily centered around serving and enriching our students. Uh, awesome, awesome. And I know that in Pittsburgh, there are a number of issues that have impacted students of color uh, throughout the system. I went to Temple University um, in Philly, so a lot of my friends are from the 412. A lot of Pittsburgh mm -hmm. friends, and they've given me some insight about their upbringing in Pittsburgh public schools. And, and when I actually came to the State of Black Learning Conference last year to present, I was able to connect with a couple of my buddies um, from college. And yeah, I think good. some of them actually know you because, you know, you all grew up together. And basically, they're like, the things that are happening now with students of color were happening 15, 20 years ago when they were going to school. So it hasn't really changed yeah. that much. So yeah. Um, yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to ask you, as a school leader, what do you believe are the major issues that are impacting Black folks, Latinx folks in um, Pittsburgh public schools? Money. Money. Um, um, money. Yeah. It, 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 I'm astonished at, um, you know, every year a report comes out called the A plus schools report and it, and it highlights academics, uh, cost per pupil per school, right. how students are growing or dropping on PSSA, uh, uh, our state standardized tests, yeah, et cetera. PSATs, yeah. And I'm always, um, um, intrigued by the amount of money per student, per pupil, that is spent where there is a greater amount of need. You would think that where there are students who are doing less well off on the state step tests and scores, who we know have economic disadvantage, who we know have been oppressed and, and systemically uh, held down throughout their educational and, and personal lives, and we spend less money there. How, how is that possible? Yeah. And, and, then, and then the the world is hit with the coronavirus, and now we're moving bailouts for corporations and, and, and companies that, that we can't move that quick to get kids a quality education. It, it blows my mind, brother. It just yeah. blows my mind. So, so as a business guy, I know what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the bottom line being protected at all costs, no matter what. We're going to protect the bottom line, and we're going to protect. We're going to protect the um, the power class that exists. And in most places, whether it's a black ran organization or a white ran organization. It's the people at the top in power that are protecting themselves and protecting their, the most privileged class among them. And unfortunately, in, in our public education system, that most privileged class is still white children and their families. Um, I couldn't have said it any better. And this is something that is not just happening in Pittsburgh, but this is happening in many urban metropolitan areas. This was a case when I was a teacher in Philadelphia, when I was a teacher in Boston. It's happened in Atlanta. Any urban metropolitan area you can think of, this same mm -hmm. trend is taking place where when we talk about money, it's not a case where there's a lack of money. It's really a misallocation of those funds. Yeah. That's really yeah. Um, contributing yeah. to this this cycle that we continue to see even to this present day. Right. 
Right. And let me just, just make this point before your next question, if, sure. if I may. Yes. Uh, and let me, let me capture this. I grew up in a union household. So I am the product of a, a union contract, yes. right? However, there is no union for black children that exists. They, 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 they don't have the resources to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm always perplexed at how the adults prioritize their defense, their personal defense over the well-being and the welfare of the children. Yes. And so in, in so many instances, our school boards are filled with former educators or former parents. And what they're doing is they're protecting the, their interests as an adult, as a, as, a, as a human being, or the personal interest of their child. And in so many cases, it's, it's just, it's horrible. It's mm -hmm. horrible right. what the American education system has done and allowed to happen to black children. It's horrible. It is. And just staying on this idea of unions and just the lack of a black student union for black students, or just students of color in general in yeah. our country, I wanna, I wanna rewind a little bit because as you know for sure, there was a public education forum in your backyard in Pittsburgh. Yeah. For the Democratic presidential candidates. And there was a lot of controversy swirling around that because, as I'm sure you followed, there hasn't been much conversation about public education throughout this whole uh, presidential campaign. You've heard a lot right. about immigration. You've heard a lot about... Right wiping student debt you've heard a lot about increasing taxes for the wealthy some of the issues that you hear pretty much every four years from these candidates right now just as a school leader and as someone who's a product of the public school system i want to capture your thoughts on the forum but also i want to gauge what your confidence level is as far as the candidates being able to improve the state of education in our country. So it's a twofold uh, question. <laughs> oh, listen, bro. I didn't watch it. Uh, I didn't go. I believe that it was a, um, another opportunity to grandstand. Um, and I don't, I don't believe that any president, um, presidential candidate, or even president in recent history has really taken education as a priority because many of them, as they should, see, see education as a local issue. Mm -hmm. And that's okay to see it that way. What's not okay is to not be a powerful and forceful leader in making sure that, that your citizens have the best quality education in comparison to other countries. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not confident in any of the candidates that any of them have done that, that really well. Mm -hmm. I also wanna say that I think that it's important for black folks in particular to dig deep into the, the understanding of charter schools and how they came about why they came about and understand that that although there's a lot in there that's um that's that's bad and negative or could create potential bad or negative outcomes yes there's a lot of power in the law for black families there's a lot of power in the law um and and we've got to understand that and we've, we've got to walk the tightrope but we've got to understand that there's a lot of power for our, for our, to, for, to take control of our, edu our education. Um, and I think what's happened is the teachers union and other special interests have made charter schools a new boogeyman. And it was busing at one point, it was integration at another point. Charters are, are the new boogeyman. We want to either keep black kids out or now black kids are segregating or whatever. I just want my son to have a quality education. And I, I happen to believe that a quality education cannot be whitewashed. And I, I cannot afford for my son 
to start his primary education in a system that does not teach him or tell him about Martin Luther King, Madam C.J. Walker, Frederick Douglass, Maya Angelou, or any of these other amazing wow. Black people or Black experiences that existed in his life, that he should have to wait until he's in middle school to find out how great Blackness was if I'm not teaching it at home. Because in many instances, as a parent, we may not have gotten that information either. No, no. You know, um, and so we don't know the, the depth and the breadth of our greatness and our, our, our majesty. And I can't afford to have my son going to a school too soon and not having that foundation in his, in his experience. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And as somebody who is a product of the American school system, I can attest to the fact that I didn't really learn about my history until I became a student at Temple University when I mm. was an, an African-American Facts. studies minor. Facts. Yeah. That's when I started to learn about my history. And it's not to take away the, the work that my teachers from K to 12 did to get me prepared for college because I had a lot of great teachers, uh, most of whom were white. But the reality mm -hmm. yeah, is, but, but the reality is I didn't get the education that I needed as far as understanding who I was culturally. Right. You know, and, right. and that's something that right. we, we do have to change. And I know that um, in Philadelphia, there is a movement there. You now have the, the Center for Black Educator movement with uh, Sharif el Mekki, you know, another good brother, oh, yeah. doing some great work. Oh, yeah. You have BMAC. You have a lot of these movements that are starting to come into fruition. Um, and and mm -hmm. that's something that, you know, we definitely have to have more of. But then just going back to what you're saying about charter schools, I think it's a very, it's a nuanced conversation we have to have because as somebody who's taught in both the charter schools and then schools within the district, I think with charter schools, there are good charter schools and bad charter schools. And think, absolutely. And I think we have to be careful in how we make these gross generalizations um, about the Absolutely, quality of, yeah. of charter schools because I've been to one that wasn't too good, but I've been to one that was well functioning, and you had support mm -hmm. from the board, you had support from the parents, and you could tell that there was a genuine interest in providing a quality education uh, for the student yeah. body. So we we do have to be careful about that. Yeah, I, I think also. And I think yeah. yeah go ahead. Alan Perry said it to me uh, when we were at South by Southwest last year best. He said, listen, man, I'm a skeptic of all schools. There you go. And, yeah. and there are some that want us to just be skeptical of charter schools. When the reality is that, that as parents, as community members, we need to be skeptical of every school so that we are thoroughly evaluating it on, on, a, on a true scale of how it is impacting our communities respectively. And so I look at every school, whether it's a private, parochial, independent, charter, traditional, public, I look at them all the same way. How are you gonna educate my son? And if you can't educate my son to my standards, then you can't educate any other black kid because I've got the highest expectations for the type of learning and experience my son should have. And that's what I bring to work with me every day is, is if, if this is what I would expect from my son, then I can expect it for everybody else. And there are, there are parents that expect more than I expect from my son, which is great too, because that yeah. challenges my accountability, right? There you go. But we've got to raise the bar for everyone, bro, and make sure that, that and, and I'm kind of in a, in a very comfortable space in my life where I don't have a problem talking about black people exclusively. White folks, I, I love you. I appreciate your help. You didn't do it all right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not your fault. Some of you had nothing to do with this. And I want you to know that I'm not taking it out on you. But, but guess what? Black folks need to focus on black folks for a little bit. And it would be great. It would be great if white folks would focus on helping black folks too for a little bit and stop helping themselves. Because the reality is that until we put, it's like, um, we're, we're running a race, right? You get two laps head start. 
I'm faster than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm everything better than you. But you got two laps of a head start. I might never catch up. That's no true. matter how great I am. And the only way, and the only way I'm now, now let's preface, I said may. I may never catch up because I believe that there's some of us who could, who could get it done. There you go. If the race is long enough. Yes. Right? But the only way to make that race fair is for you, my white brother, to stop running. If you if you want it to be a fair race, stop running. Let me catch up. Let me catch my breath and let, let, let's start it again. And I think that there's a fear that exists within losing that says, I'll help you as much as I can, but just not enough to let you catch up. And so every day when I go to work, um, I'm, I'm working with my students to understand that we could close that gap, man. We can catch up. We just got to run harder. And sometimes we got to start first. Sometimes we might just have to jump out the gate before the gun goes off too and get a little head start. Nah, that's, that's very true. And the thing that's very complex about this issue is the fact that, you know, you have all this conversation about increasing the number of black educators, particularly black male educators. But we have to remind ourselves, we were, all of us were products of a, well, most of us were products of a whitewashed curriculum. So you have to be very selective in the type of black folk you have in your schools teaching the children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think we've come yeah. to this, we've come to this narrative where people are talking about recruiting and trying to retain black educators, particularly black males without taking into account the fact that we all have different cultural upbringings. We all come from a different type of black. Like in my case, both my parents are from West Africa. They grew up in Ghana. So mm -hmm. I grew up in a household where both my parents were college educated. We knew mm -hmm. that after high school, we would go to college. We didn't know there were alternative options like community college or apprenticeships or trade school. Mm -hmm. We just thought, oh, everybody mm -hmm. goes to college after high school. But then when I became a teacher and I've taught in Title I schools my whole career, urban, 90 plus percent, African-American, and then the rest of the races are just divided within the 10 percent. That's been my experience. And they didn't have the same upbringing that I did, but we both black. Right. So we have right. to be very careful about who we put in front of our children, but also just mm -hmm. understand that this issue is very complex. So it's not about just putting a black face there. It's about, okay, we need to figure out how we're going to integrate a more culturally responsive curriculum that's going to speak to the identity of our children. Mm -hmm. So that when they do leave the K-12 level, they know exactly who they are and they can question and critique mm -hmm. what goes on in our world. And I, I completely agree with you. And I think if, if we, we include in that, that ex experience or that process, the idea that we should, we should understand that our potential teachers are sitting in front of us every day in the classroom and that we've got to model as a teacher we've got to model the joy in the profession yeah the excitement in the profession even when it's not joyful or exciting yes because we're if we want to keep it around then we've got to sell it right it's like a model who's got some tight pumps on and they might be tight as hell but she got to sell them shoes. So she go walk in it and, yeah. and kick them off in the back. You yeah. feel me? Yeah. That's so really, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's that, that idea. And then as, as administrators, we've got to do our best to celebrate teachers who are every single day, every single day, not by every parent and not by every student, 
but by too many students and by too many parents being beat down, both psychologically and physically, and and therefore it beats it beats them in the profession, man. And they just want to they want to roll. Some who were called, and I believe this is mission call work. Some who were called to be in the classroom are beat down by the experience, and that's because, um, in all honesty, I get back to it. We don't have enough resources. No. If I could have two or three teachers in every classroom, or two teachers, and if I could have three adults in the classroom with twenty kids, come on, bro. Yeah. You're telling a whole different story, man. Yeah. You're telling a whole different story. Yes. And yes. guess what? The money's there. They just choose to use it in different ways. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. If you go to the more affluent communities and the schools out there, they have the extra manpower in mm -hmm. order to do such things as differentiated learning. You can actually yep. break kids up into small groups. You can actually have conferences with students yep. without the fear yep. of losing control of the class because it's just you Right. And there's about 25 right. to 30, in some cases more than that amount right. of students in the in the classroom. So right. there, there are a lot yeah. of other factors that we'd have to talk about, but that's just another conversation for another day. Um, yeah. But we do have a little less than 10 minutes to go, and I do want to give you a chance to talk about the State of Black Learning Conference. And um, before you talk yeah. about that, I have to say this because I attended last year's conference and even though i was there for a couple of days it was one of the best conferences i ever attended uh, and i want to say this because usually when i go to conferences and i've been to many of them we do focus on this on the children but it's very much traditional where okay you have a bunch of experts educators throughout the nation who present a topic that they share with educators and other staff members that they can bring back to their schools. What I liked about the State of Black Learning Conference was the fact that we asked the students directly. They were, there was a student body that was there that had a chance to share and advocate for themselves and really provide their perspective on what goes on within schools. And we don't always hear that in the conferences we go to. So I thought that was very unique mm -hmm. um, about the conference. So I wanted to shout that out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, man. So the the state of black learning is um, it's a labor of love. When I um, when I was looking at the budget a couple years ago, and I'm talking to some other brothers that are administrators and CEOs in, in Pittsburgh, I'm like, yo, we spend this this amount of money on training. We should just come together, bring our money together, and bring our teachers together and do, you know, do a, a diversity series. Well, that diversity series in its first year had like 370 people. Okay. And then it had 400 last year. And this year we're hoping to, to, to surpass that 400. Because the design is like you said, it is student centered. I think the best way it was captured at the conference last year was was by the brothers from the Eight Black Hands, and it was, um, how do kids? Like if we start our day, if that's the question that we ask ourselves every time we're making a tough decision, how are the kids? That should center who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it. Yeah. And that, that's what State of Black Learning does. It, it is designed almost exclusively to tap into the soul of the educator and to inspire and nurture and develop within that soul an understanding and a love and a care and a compassion for the black children unapologetically. We're talking about black children. For the black children that you serve. And so this year, um, I'm really excited. I don't know if you saw... Um, CNN, they did a series a while back that kind of highlighted education, politics, policing in, um, in Chicago. And there was a principal there, uh, her name was Liz Dozier. 
And she was a young sister. She was uh, going into Fanger High School, which was one of uh, the, the most statistically worst high schools in Chicago. They got a big grant from the feds. Arnie Duncan was the secretary of, of education at the time. Big mm. grant. She goes in. She turns the school around. Liz is now leading an organization called Chicago and Beyond. And I thought, let's, we're, we, we're all dealing on some level with what Liz was dealing with at Fanger High. And what, what I want to know as an administrator who's got a lot of discipline problems, a lot of referrals coming in from teachers, how do we shift that culture? Um, how, do we, how do we turn it around? And Liz, I don't know that, you know, I'm sure there are other people who are doing the work, but Liz um, brings, brings a youthful kind of perspective to it that I'm thinking uh, would be great. And so Liz is coming down and she's going to be one of our headliners. And then Dr. Joy DeGruy, who is the brain power behind post-traumatic slave syndrome. Um, she will be coming to, to, to pull at the knowledge um, um, threads that exist within us as educators, black and white. So most of our, our attendees, many of our attendees are white. And that's great. Because at the end of it, they're like, oh, my God, Chase, thank you so much for showing me the light. Like, I didn't, you know. And that, that means that we got to do this at a grander scale because a lot of our educators, many of them who have been career educators, just don't get it. And a lot of our newer educators need this support, right? They need to understand what's going on. And so Dr. DeGru is going to come in and she's going to talk about post-traumatic -tra post um, slave syndrome and then we're going to you know sprinkle some eight black hands in there i hope you'll be back i hope so. you know we, we we're going to sauce it up with with a lot of powerful stuff that's that always is centered around how are the kids and um this year's theme is focused um reimagining or redesigning the next decade where black learners um matter I, I I lost the theme, but uh, it's along those lines. So it's it's expected to be a powerful conference. I do want to say, in light of what's going on with the coronavirus, um, there there may be some delay um, in pushing it out. But right now we're we're booked for August thirteenth and fourteenth. So hopefully our government can get it together uh, in enough time to to get us back to some sense of normalcy in the next uh, month or two. Uh, but um, absolutely. So for those who have, so not, those who have not, not been to the State of Black Learning Conference, you need to go this year. I went last year, and the headliners last year were um, Roland Martin, who I'm a big fan of, and he was powerful, as well as yeah. Dr. Bettina Love. Yeah. You, you have to go. So you have some heavy hitters in the education space who are doing the work, who are all about educating our black children. And if you're passionate about that, this is the conference for you. So I implore you to look it up. I'll be posting information about it uh, when this episode airs and just throughout the next few weeks so that you can get as much information as possible about how to register and if you want to be a presenter and share That's right. something you're passionate about as far as content. There's some protocols there that you'd have to follow, but it, it's a great opportunity to just learn from some great educators. But uh, one quick question, well, one quick question yeah. and another one before you go, cause I know you have to go. Um, with the State of Black Learner Conference, now I know it's been based in Pittsburgh every single year. Are there yeah. any future plans to maybe expand it to maybe a more national scale? Start moving. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so I I believe that we are at a national scale now because yes, people okay. come from everywhere to the conference. However, I do uh, we do get a lot of requests about going to other places mm. um and if if we're at a position where we've got enough funding 
that I can get somebody to manage that aspect of it. Cause right now I'm doing the conference and the school and it's me and my, my assistant, like tag team in this joint the whole way through. Her name is Karee Stevens. She's amazing. Yes, she is. Um, and, and so uh, we would need to get another person to work with Karee for us to get it somewhere because our expectations are, are high as they should be. And so we want to make sure that we're crossing all the I's and dotting all the T's so that our participants enjoy themselves and get the most out of the experience. So we would have to do some traveling to advance the conference, but uh, I believe we'll get there. No, I believe so too, because I mean, I came all the way from Boston to attend this conference, even though it was a predominantly Pittsburgh crowd, I still felt yeah. the love and you could just see how powerful it was. Cause he had brothers from Florida sisters from Georgia, other parts of the nation yeah. just coming through. So the word is definitely spreading. But I know yeah. um, our time is running out. So I do want to thank you, Mr. Chase Patterson, for you, taking the time to speak with us. And if you could just share your social media information so that people can follow you and to just stay updated sure. about the Black Learning Conference, that would be awesome. Yeah. So uh, my Facebook is K dot Chase Patterson. That's K period Chase Patterson. My um, uh, Twitter and um, Instagram handle are, well, my Instagram is at K-A-N-G underscore Chase. And my uh, Twitter is at K Chase Patterson. All right. Thank you, sir. So y'all heard it. If you haven't registered or have even thought about going to Stead Black Learning Conference, please go ahead and look it up. I know there's a, a website specifically for the conference, which I believe is operating, or is it um, yep. State, operating right State now? Stateofblacklearning.com. Yep. There you go. So make sure you all check it out to learn more about this wonderful conference. And um, on behalf of Mr. Chase Patterson, this is Kwame Salfamensa. So wherever you are in the world, I want to say good afternoon, good morning, good night, and we're going to do this again another time. Peace.